some questions uh, based on how God uh, deals with you or, or, or doesn't deal with you uh, can uh, be like a cancer that eats away at your once vibrant faith. Uh, there is uh, what I would call an expectation barrier where you expect based upon what you've studied about God, what you know about God, you expect for God to act in a certain fashion based on your finite understanding of God. But then when God doesn't act in a fashion that you find is prudent, fair, just, etc., cetera, uh, it causes problems. Uh, it causes some people to begin to doubt their faith. And that's when the cancer cell begins to be dropped into your, your spiritual life and starts to eat away at it. Uh, I don't know which position best describes you. There's those who uh, face adversity uh, and think God has completely checked out on them and because he didn't, he didn't act in a way that they thought he should have acted. And then there's others who b blaze right through uh, whatever God brings their way because their faith is strong and sure. Uh, I would suspect that uh, we have people on both sides of that equation. Uh, Moses uh, felt that tension in his life of uh, what it was like uh, for God to act in a way that you did not anticipate. Uh, he was uh, uh, asked by God, really commanded by God, to go to Pharaoh and to give Pharaoh the word to let uh, the Israelites go. Uh, the story is recounted in Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, where uh, Moses goes into the Pharaoh's presence and uh, says, Let my people go that they may feast it uh, to me, speaking to God, uh, in the wilderness. Uh, Pharaoh's cocky response to the, to the command uh, from this old man Moses was... Uh, really blasphemous. Uh, he looks at Moses in his powerful court and says to him, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? It, it translated, Pharaoh saying, God, God is nothing to me. But Moses was really there on divine assignment because God had told him, go give the word to Pharaoh and uh, Pharaoh is going to release the Israelites. Uh, later that day, uh, Pharaoh commanded his taskmasters to stop giving the Jews uh, their straw for brick making. Uh, he said uh, that uh, I want the quotas to stay the same, but they're going to have to find their own straw. So when the people went out into the fields uh, and found what straw residue they could find uh, to add to the bricks, that took up most of the day. So the, the quotas for the brick, bricks began to drop. When that occurred, uh, Pharaoh responded by having the taskmasters begin to beat the people into submission. Uh, when that injustice occurred, that oppression, uh, the Israelites uh, chose leaders from among them, and they sent a delegation to speak to Pharaoh. Uh, Exodus 5, 15 to 16 talks about that delegation. Uh, they didn't get anywhere with the dictator, uh, and on their way out of the meeting with the dictator, they ran into Moses and Aaron, who happened to be standing outside, uh, ready to talk with them. Uh, they uh, instantly and angrily unloaded all over Moses. In verse 21 of chapter 5 of Exodus, they said, Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put the sword in their hand to kill us. Translated in our vernacular, Moses, what were you thinking? You waltzed in there and told Pharaoh to let us all go and look at what's happened. Now he's beating us. We can't make our brick quotas. Life is worse. You should have just kept to yourself. Uh, we have no record in that uh, context of Moses responding to the Israelites, uh, giving some kind of counter-argument. I'm sure he just stood there before them absolutely stunned because his expectation was, God commanded me to go to speak to Pharaoh. I'll give Pharaoh the word. Pharaoh would submit and release the people. That did not occur. God did not behave like Moses thought he was going to behave. And so they, uh, there's a, a question that he's going to unload on God. And it's found in verses 22 to 23 of chapter 5. He says, Lord, why have you brought me, uh, brought, you, brought this trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. You can sense his frustration. His expectation was, I did what you told me to do, and now look at the result. It's worse than it was before. God, what were you thinking? See, Moses had uh, been obedient with what he knew about God, and he's feeling like he went out on the proverbial limb for God before the most powerful man on the planet, Pharaoh, and that God then saw the limb off behind him and, and left him out there. You ever had a situation like that where you felt like, I am merely doing what the scriptures say, what I think God wants me to do. This is prudent. This is wise. This is the way things go with people who follow God. And you follow God only to be out on the proverbial limb and have God seemingly cut it off. 
See, that was uh, Moses' feeling, that expectation. Maybe you have an expectation of, in your life that you're struggling with, and because God didn't operate like you thought he should operate, you now have this cancerous doubt in your mind that's eating away at you. Uh, there was a man uh, years ago uh, who worked at the temple. Uh, he was a Levite. Uh, he was a musician. He was a worship leader. Uh, he worked during David's reign, according to 1 Chronicles 15, 16 through 19. Uh, his name was Asaph. Uh, and he wrestled with the problem that Moses wrestled with, that maybe it's one that you're wrestling with. He's a godly man who understands the scriptures, and he's anticipating God to work in a certain way in his life as he looks at the godless around him. And when God doesn't act in the fashion he thinks God should act in, he starts having problems with his faith. And he's going to look around in this passage and share his journey as he worked from having vibrant faith to having very shaky faith to then having a fierce faith. He's going to take you through his journey, and uh, I would, uh, would hope that his journey would be your journey. Because the question that he's going to lay out on the table here, if you study this psalm in detail, uh, is this particular question. How do you move from dangerous doubt to fierce faith? How do you move from dangerous doubt to fierce faith? Because doubt doesn't start in a massive way. It's just a small little question that you begin to think about God. Well, why, why didn't he do this? Why did he permit that? Why did he take that person out of my life, etc.? You begin to have that little bit of doubt, and that begins to snowball. Well, let's look at, uh, at Asaph's journey as he dealt with doubt. Uh, we're going to move through it uh, structurally and make comments as we look at his, uh, uh, his lessons on how to move from doubt to faith uh, by looking first at verse 1 where he, he has what I would call the proclamation. He makes a very positive proclamation. In fact, he puts out at the very beginning, before he gets into the details of his doubt and how he questioned God, he lets you know where he stands spiritually. Look at verse 1. His proclamation, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Pure in heart is just a code word for those who are mature, those who hear the word of God, obey the word of God. He says, it is a fact that God is good to his people who love him and follow hard after him. I'm sure if you're a Christian, uh, you could amen that in your living room, wherever you are, go, yeah, that's absolutely true of God. That's his premise. But the problem is we can embrace that premise as true as it is, but then in the rough, uh, tumble, tumble nature of life, when things happen to you, where God begins to allow things to occur in your life that are adverse, that you think are un, uh, not just, you, you, you don't deserve them, uh, things begin to happen, you begin to question that premise. But he starts out by saying, let me, let me tell you where I stand first. Uh, I am a man who loves God, and I've, I've seen God bless those who are pure in heart. But he says, let me take you through my journey of how my great stellar faith uh, was put to test. And that's what we find in verses 2 to 12. It's what I call the problem. He moves from a proclamation that's positive to the problem, which is totally negative. Notice uh, the first word, but, as for me, it's an adversative. Uh, in fact, uh, this is called a, a vav, or it's, a, it's the word and, wedded to a uh, a, a, a pronoun, which makes it totally emphatic. He says, I, I know God blesses those who are pure in heart, but as for me, I've had my own personal issues with my faith. Notice what he says, but as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. And then he says, yeah, my, my, my steps, they almost slipped. See, he, he, he says, I, I can hardly believe it. I I, Asaph, the worship leader of the church, the one who writes songs for Israelites to sing, the godly man among people that people see on the stage uh, at the temple leading in worship and singing and worshiping God, I, of all people, came really close to throwing in the spiritual towel. You know, if, if you think that spiritual leaders like myself or any of our pastors on staff, any of our leaders uh, down below them, uh, don't struggle occasionally uh, with things that happen to them, and ask questions, I think again. Because we all have things that happen that the expectation from God, uh, well, it's, it's not what you thought. And he says, I, I've been there, I've done that. My feet came close to stumbling. He makes a, a, a shocking uh, analysis of the specifics of his journey, which tells you if you're struggling with what God's allowing in your life, uh, how things are going, and you think it's, it's, it's not fair, it's unjust, um, Get real. That's what he does. He's open. He's authentic. He's transparent. God wants to know what you are thinking. So he gets down into the specifics here, and there's a, many verses about this, uh, forms the heart of the passage. So 
I would say to you, go and do likewise. Get specific with God. Notice what he says about what he saw in his journey. He says, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He said, I began to look at the lost around me, what they had, how well their lives went, how easy it was for them. And I began to look at that and think, man, they've got it made over there. I don't. And as you work down through verses 2 to 12, you're going to find one interesting fact. He doesn't speak about his vibrant relationship with God anywhere in these verses. Because once you start comparing your life to the godless, and you start looking at what they have and what you don't have, the things that they experience that, well, you don't have those great experiences, your life seems tough and difficult. The minute you don't have God as your focus and you focus on the lost around you, well, things spiral. And he says, I'm just going to tell you up front, I, I started looking around at the lost around me, and, and I, I, I just started envying them. You know the drill. Godless person with very little morals starts a business and does well. I mean, it just accelerates. It expands. It, it flourishes. Uh, his contact base increases. It just, I mean, it's like the Midas touch. But, but you went out as a godly person, tried to start a business, and it was like swimming a, a, up a mighty river. I mean, everything seemed to be against you. You lost this, you lost that, you might have lost your nest egg, etc. And you start looking around at that thinking, well, God, why, why is that lost person so blessed when I've had it so difficult? See, that's that cancerous doubt that begins to drop in there. He says in verse 4, he says, For there are no pains in their death, speaking of the godless, and their body is fat. Uh, this is an, un, an unfounded, illogical statement because once you take God out of, the, of your life and aren't focusing on Him and focus on the lost around you, you're going to start making sweeping statements about them that are absolutely not true. I mean, is it true that when a godless person dies, there's no pain in their death? Well, I mean, who would ever say that? Of, of course there's pain in, in the lives of those who don't know God when they die. Um, he, he says, it just feels like when I look at life that... When they die, it seems peaceful. I don't know if you remember uh, Billy Joel. Uh, I love Billy Joel's music because he's a pianist. I like to play the piano. I have, I have, I think, all of his music at home. Um, but he has that one song about only the good die young. He's, he's, he's you know, looking at that as, as, as a man analyzing in life, and he's looking at it from the carnal, godless perspective. But it's like, why would you want to live a, a godly, holy life over there? You're going to die young. It's, it's the godly, godless people that live long. It's just that kind of motif. Uh, what kind, it says here, their, their body is fat. Um, this, this word uh, here where he talks about uh, that there's no pains in their death uh, and um, their um, uh, body is fat, he's, he's basically saying that they have whatever they want. They, they get whatever they want. There's no limitations to what they're able to do. Uh, they are enjoying life to the fullest. Um, but if you look back at your life, you can say, well, there's years in my life where things, wow, they went south. I started thinking back through my life as I was working on this psalm thinking, yeah, I remember many years where, wow, it just went off the grid. Uh, 1969 to 1970 were two years that I remember well. Uh, during that time when I was a, a, a young kid, uh, I think I was about 11, 12 years old, uh, my dad lost his oldest of his 10 sisters to brain cancer and one of my favorite aunts, uh, my Aunt B. Uh, he also lost his father to a blood clot, uh, my Grandpa Whiteford. And then my mother turned around and lost uh, her dad, my Grandpa Dorsey, who lived down the street from me. That was not a good year. And when you look at that, when I looked at that as a young kid and I thought, wow, three people in our family in like, in like within a year and a half cycle? What's up with that? You begin to look at the godless around you. I remember my mom said that when my grandpa died, and I think he was around 54, 55 years old when he had brain cancer, uh, her dad, she said she pulled up to a traffic light one day after her dad died, and she saw a, a bum. I, back then, we called them hobos. We don't use that term anymore, but that's the 1960s term. She said she saw an old hobo standing there, uh, you know, unshaven, dirty, etc. And my mom, as a young Christian woman, said she looked at him and thought to herself, why'd you take my dad? And why'd you leave him? You ever thought something like that? See, that's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, you know, when you, when you live a life of faith, you expect God to do certain things. And sometimes he takes your father or he takes your grandfather and he leaves others that you as a Christian would think, why are they here? But God has 
purposes and plans way beyond us. But it's that transparent sharing that Asaph is talking about. He said, I'm just sharing my heart. Verse 5, he says, they, the godless, they're not in trouble as other men, and they're not plagued like other men. I mean, if you think about it, it, when you look at the loss, it's like, how do they constantly get away with doing sinful things? They just seem to constantly get away. But you get on the freeway, and you go five miles over the speed limit, and just, you know, you're really getting beyond where you normally go. And next thing you know, there's this motorcycle officer there with a speed camera just waiting to clock you and pull you over. And you're like, you're kidding me. I mean, I've had people tell me this. It's like I, I, I was, you know, kind of going with the flow, whatever it was, you know, 5, 10 miles over the speed limit. People were passing me, but I got the ticket. I mean, it's like uh, Murphy's Law for the Christian. And this is what he's saying. It's God, they don't seem to be plagued like Christians are plagued. It's like Christians have a, a boatload of adversity. They seem to just kind of go through life uh, effortlessly. Verse 6, he says, uh, therefore, based on the fact that they pretty much get away with what they want to do, pride is their necklace and the garment of violence covers them. Pride is their necklace and the garment of violence covers them. Uh, the word therefore in the Hebrew text is emphatic. He says, let me summarize what it's like when I look at the life of the godless. They live a life of unchecked sin, where they don't really pay the penalties of their sin. I see them getting away with their sin, and they wear their, their, their evil, their arrogance, their hubris, like a necklace for everyone to see. And he said, when you look at their, the garment that surrounds them, uh, it's, it's violence. It's violence. It's all about them. Uh, see, because he said, for the godless, it seems like pride pays for them. Pride pays. Boy, when I look at my culture, it seems that's true. It does look like pride pays. It does seem like godless people get away with all kinds of outright evil. And then he says they wear a, a clothing that's violent. See, this kind of goes together. The prideful person that gets away with their sin uh, naturally resorts to violence. The word here for violence, uh, Dr. Alan Ross, who taught me Hebrew at Dallas Seminary, Hamas is the word from which you, it's very similar, Hamas is the Palestinian uh, word, word, which is very similar to this one. Uh, the word uh, violence, it means social injustice that leads to oppression. See, the person that gets away with their sin of oppressing others and, and dealing with others uh, in ways that elevate themselves, they, they feel like uh, they can get away with things, so they do things, mean-spirited things, to control other people. That's what Pharaoh did. When Moses came in and said, let, God wants you to let his people go, and Pharaoh said, I don't know God. And I'm not letting the people go. And I'm going to increase how you guys are going to have to make bricks, make it more difficult. See, he oppressed the Israelites in his power. Asaph says, why do people like that get away with that? Verse 7, he says, their eyes, they, they bulge from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. Bulging eyes is just a Semitic way of saying they get what they want. I don't know if you've ever overeaten, probably not in this church because there are many godly people. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I, when, my, when I was dating Liz and our, my, her parents lived next door to my parents uh, when we were dating on a cul-de-sac, um, you know, when I went home at Christmas or Thanksgiving, I had to, you know, eat what my mother cooked, which was enough for, you know, an army. And then I had to go, that was at noon, and then I had to go next door at her mom's house, and I had to show respect for her mother who had cooked everything for her family, and I had to eat. I don't even, what, I 10, 15,000 calorie day. I mean, I was reading this thinking, yeah, I get the eye bulging thing where you have eaten so much, it's just like your eyes are gonna pop out of your head. See, he says, these people, they, they, they're just fat on their sin and they think that they get away with it. And it's just, their, their imaginations are constantly running to riot. Uh, it's a difficult Hebrew text uh, phrase, but it really means that they are constantly coming up with new ideas to do that are wicked. You name me a week that you have not paid attention to your society, looked at other people, read the news, watched lives, and not had, their, had your mouth agape wondering what new evil thing can they think of doing. That's what this means. You know, eyes bulging from the fatness of their evil and their imaginations constantly coming up with new things. Arrogance. Arrogance. When I was in high school, uh, one of my dad's uh, agents that worked for him uh, as my dad was the port supervisor of a port of entry in Calexico, California, one of his uh, agents uh, had issues. Uh, and he, uh, my dad had to serve him papers and arrest him uh, one day. So uh, it was a sad day. Well, my dad had to arrest one of his own agents. But uh, 
the situation was this particular agent hadn't cashed his government check, paycheck, in a year. I don't know any government agent that's infinitely wealthy. You know, I mean, this guy had a family, et cetera, but he had a new house, he had a new boat, jet skis, whatever. He had all the toys, but he, but he hadn't cashed a government check. So the logical question was, well, what is agent so-and-so living on? So they began to in, uh, investigate the man and found out that he was taking money from cartels. So he was living large. And he was, he was so cocky and arrogant. My dad said that they uh, did a little investigation because they're all federal agents, and they found out that this was the guy that was going around in the lunchroom where they had all their lockers with their food, and he would selectively go into guys' lockers and taste different parts of their food. Unbelievable. My, my dad said that the arrogance of this guy, you would have a sandwich cut in half, and half would be gone. You would have dessert, the dirt, dessert's gone. Or, you know, five donuts, three are gone, two are left. I mean, unbelievable. All that, hap all that went away when they arrested the man. But it's just that arrogance. For one year, he thought he was bulletproof. They appear unstoppable, but such is not the case as we're going to see. Uh, when they uh, feel like they're unstoppable, like this particular agent, it says in verse 8, they mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. They will waste no time mocking a Christian, mocking a moral person, mocking a godly father, mocking a godly mother, mocking a godly college student. They will waste no time doing that because they think that their way is the way. Prideful, is it not? This is what, this is what Pharaoh did when he said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let his people go? Who is he? compared to me. See the hubris? See, the Pharisees uh, in Christ's day acted like Pharaoh. Uh, their pride and their power were so great that even with God standing there in front of them, they didn't even recognize God. Uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 9, there was an episode uh, in a synagogue uh, where we read about their arrogance and their pride when they met Christ face to face. It says in verse 9, now when they had departed from there, he, he, Jesus, went into a synagogue. And this is interesting. He's going into the synagogue on Shabbat, which is Saturday. He's going in. So he's, he's basically going on the offense to take the, the word of truth to them on their turf. It says in verse 10, behold, there was a, a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, notice this is not a, this is, this is a loaded question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Uh, they, they asked him that question. It says that they might accuse him. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a, a, a pit uh, on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value than is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he, Jesus, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand and he restored it whole like the others. Notice what happened after that. The Pharisees then went out. They weren't high-fiving each other and praising God. No, they went out and they plotted against him how they might destroy him. So this is what godless people do when they don't get their way. Their pride leads to oppression, leads to elimination and silencing of all those they can't stand. They couldn't stand Christ because he took them to task on their own turf. Which is greater, to heal a man on Shabbat or obey your legalistic laws? See, Jesus said, my Father and I, the Trinity, are more concerned about the, the love and the law, not the letter of the law. But such is the nature of those who, as Asaph says, are the godless around you. It says in verse 10, therefore the people, he says, return to this place and the waters of abundance are drunk by them. He's barely, merely saying, when you have a person who's, uh, who's, who's, who's arrogant and prideful and wicked in what they do and they advance through life with little uh, adversity occurring to them, uh, people run to them. That's what he says. They, people return to this place. They, they love to be around a person like that. It says, waters of abundance are drunk by them. Because if this person is really doing well business-wise, but, but they, they do it in an unethical way, but they're still making money, they're going to attract other people who want some of the action. Uh, years ago, when I was living in California, about 30 miles from me uh, was MC Hammer. I don't know if you remember MC Hammer. Uh, I don't know about you, but I liked his music. <laughs> Can't touch this. Not that I'm going to even try to dance like MC Hammer. Don't worry. But uh, 
I could because I'm basically here by myself today, but uh, MC Hammer, man, hip-hop king, 1980s, 1990s, man, he had it going on, did he not? He had it on, he had the pants. I mean, he was paid, I think, from what I read one time, a million dollars to show up just in the pants. I, I'm here today, I don't think I'm getting 10 bucks for the pants I wore, but unbelievable. It is said that at the height of his fame, he was worth $70 million, but he had an entourage that hung out with him. And I know this from living in the area where he lived, because I knew people that would bump into him because he drove a big Hummer. Like when Hummers first came out and you would see one, you would think, what's that? I mean, nobody had Hummers, but he did. And uh, he, he said that he had a, a, an entourage that cost him $500,000 a month. $500,000 a month. If I were to give you $500,000 in one month, how long could you live on that? Unbelievable. Wasted money left and right. You know what's interesting uh, about MC Hammer now? Uh, he's not, you know, doing the hip hop thing anymore. He's now a man of God. He's a preacher. He preaches the word of God. It's, that's a whole other story. But when you look at his life back in the 80s and 90s, when he was that godless man run amok, he had this huge entourage, just like Asaph says, of people all around him. Were they his friends? No. They were there to get from him whatever they could get. Asaph says, I've seen people like that. Verse 11, he says, they say, how does God know? I mean, how does God know what we're doing? Is there any knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and, and they're always at ease, and they've increased in wealth. Asaph said, I've seen their type a million times. They do evil, and they think it's okay because they don't think God sees what they're doing. He says, uh, you know, if you start comparing your life to them, it leads to a very bad place. It trashes your faith. In fact, he's going to say it leads to a feeling of purposelessness. That's verses 13 to 16. He says, uh, notice the purposelessness he feels, the vanity he feels in his life as he compares himself with the godless. He says, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. If I had said, when I showed up at the temple, I will speak thus, or I will tell people what I really think, Behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. I would have tainted young minds that were at church that day. That's what he says. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. He says, I got this tension in my life. I'm looking at the godless. I'm seeing how they progress through life. I'm seeing godly people suffer for things that I don't think they should be suffering for. And, and, and it just seems completely unfair. So he says, it got to the point where I looked at my life and I said, why... It seems so vain that I have led a godly life. Why have I even pursued this? Have you ever been there where you looked at your life and you said, why have I followed God, God so hard when all of this stuff has happened to me? I, I have totally been there. When all kinds of adverse things come your way, whether it's problems with a child or the sickness of a child or the loss in a family or a loss of a job, and you start looking in your life and you think, my expectation was if I followed hard after God, he would bless me greatly. But look at what's happened to me. And you start looking around and looking at all the wrong pe people who are flourishing in their godlessness and you're floundering in your faith. See, if you can identify with that, well, then you're where Asaph was. But notice he tells you how he got out of that spiral. He says, uh, let me tell you about the provision. The provision is very interesting. The provision, verse 17. He says, until I came into your sanctuary, then I perceived their end. Surely uh, you set them in slippery places. You cast them down in dis to destruction. Notice the, the temporal clause is most important. It's the key to the whole passage. How did he get out of this dangerous spiral where this doubt was eating away at him and he was about to throw his faith to the wind? He says, well, I, I came to my senses. And Matt, basically, he's like the pastor. He's a priest. He says, I got myself back into the sanctuary of God. In our perspective, he came back to church. See, because before he wasn't talking about God. He was only looking at the lost around him and saying, well, why, are, why is it going so well for them? It's not going so well for me. Why should I follow God then? But that led to a great, great point of despair. See, when he got back to church is when he perceived the end of godless people. See, he got back to church, and there he began to hear the teachings from the prophets, like Isaiah, Amos, Micah. Zechariah, etc. It was at church, at the temple, where he began to hear the stories of, of the saints of old, where God did deal with them and did bless them. Uh, it, it's that 
time in churches where he got the perspective he needed to make it from day to day. See, people that have these things happen to them and they begin to ask these kind of questions, church is usually like one of the first things that goes. They don't read the Bible anymore in the morning. They don't pray. They don't want somebody praying for them. They, they pull out of Bible studies. They're not in a small group. They don't go to church very often. And they flounder. And then next thing you know, their, their faith hits the rocks. And he's telling you, you don't have to go there because God, God has answers for you. And wise people stick around and dig into adversity and learn from it. Because adversity is where God teaches you the greatest things. He says, it wasn't until I came back to your sanctuary, to the temple, that I perceived the end of the godless. That's eschatology. That's the study of the end times. When I really got the understanding that, God, you are going to deal with them one day, but you're patient now. But one day they have to give account to you. So think about Moses. Had he quit after his first encounter with Pharaoh, think of what he would have missed. Had he said, God, you've abandoned me after this first episode. I can't trust you anymore. Imagine he would have never seen God deliver the Israelites. See, if you're going to throw in the towel after one foray in, into difficulty or two or three, you see, you're going to miss God doing something amazing. Had he thrown in the towel and brooded over and pouted over that God hadn't fulfilled his word instantly, see, he would have missed out on that huge life lesson that sometimes where deep-seated sin is concerned, it takes a great wrestling match for God to display his power. And see, that was the 10 plagues. It wasn't going to take one plague, two, five. It was going to take 10. See, whatever it is that you're facing, if you, if you check out of your faith too early, you miss the greatest lessons that, that God says, no, I've got a few more difficult things to throw your way, and then you're going you're gonna to reach the zenith of a mountaintop, and it's going to be worth the hike up. Our church uh, is like a temple in a way. I mean, I know we as Christians are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I know that, that much about my faith. Uh, but being in church with God's people is kind of an equivalent to the temple and it's really ironic that I'm preaching the service today when there's nobody at church. <laughs> I, I told my wife, it's kind of funny how God works. Uh, and you're at home, probably nice fire going. Uh, you know, you're sitting there probably in your pajamas enjoying it. You can, it's totally different than coming to church. Uh, just don't get any ideas. It's better to be here. And if you can be here, because here you have accountability. You have people that are uh, other people of faith who can be authentic and transparent with you and put their arm around you and tell you, man, I have totally been there before. Let me share with you how God taught me. Let me share you the value of, 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 of preaching, of teaching, etc. that came from the body of Christ. Worship so important, so important. It's, it's how you get back on track. All that rich theology uh, leads him to say some interesting things as he closes. Notice in verse 19, he says, how are they, the godless, destroyed in a moment? He says, they, utter, they are utterly swept away by sudden terrors like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. He says, they're like a dream that you have. And when you get up in the morning, you had this bizarre dream, and you're thinking, man, that was, I mean, I got to remember that thing. And within five minutes, you're like, what was that dream about? He said, that's like the godless. You're looking at them thinking, man, they are all that. They, they have everything, it seems, in life, and nothing's happening to them. And the, here the godly are suffering over here. He says, no, no. He says, from what I learned at church, what I learned at the temple from your word, the day's going to come when they are just gone and the godless will stand there before God's presence. He goes, that's what I understand now. I lost that perspective. Verse 21, he says, my heart was embittered when I was pierced within. Then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. He said, God, when I started comparing myself to the godless around me and I didn't think about you, I was a bitter man. I was pierced like with a sword. He said, it was like I was an animal. I wasn't even thinking. But he said, that's not me anymore. Notice verse 23, nevertheless, how often is he with God? I'm continually with you. He says, you have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me, and afterward, you're going to receive me into glory. God, he says, no matter how difficult life's path is, I'm sticking close to you because I know you're with me. And one day he says, I know you're going to guide me and receive me into your glorious presence. I'm keeping my eye of what lies forward. He says, when I have in heaven, who do I have in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He says, for behold, those who are far from him uh, 
uh, from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of my God is my good. I've made the Lord my refuge that I might tell all of your works. He says, God, the true perspective is I recognize what's going to happen when you come as the judge. You're going to deal with the godless, but you're going to bless the righteous and you're going to bring sense to all the things that we've had to experience. But he says, in the meantime, until I see you face to face, you can bank on the fact that I'm going to pull up close alongside you more often than not. Is that you? Have you pulled away from God more often than not or pulled up alongside him? Because if that doubt has been eating away at your faith, well, it's time to put the doubt aside and lay the doubt at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, here, here, is, here are my questions, like, like Asaph did. He, here's my, my observations, but I'm going to get myself as close to you as possible. I'm, I'm going I'm to be in your presence more often than not. I'm going to be in worship more often than not. I'm going to be in the word above all things. I'm going to be reading and studying. I get up in the mornings uh, around 5, 530, uh, and I read for like an hour, hour and a half. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, like right now I'm reading a commentary by one of my former Hebrew professors, uh, Dr. Chisholm at Dallas Seminary. I'm reading his commentary on uh, 1 Samuel. It's very interesting uh, because it's, it's teaching me how to navigate in the world in which I live. The, the questions that I have uh, as he talks about the rise, and, rise, and rise of King Saul and all the things that King Saul did that were contrary to God and how that impacted the people in a negative way and the rise of King David and it's just showing the sovereign hand of God over the nation. Those are words I need to hear now, that God's sovereign, even in the adversities that I see around me, God's sovereign, he has his plan, he's working his plan, and it teaches me. Do you think I have never read 1 Samuel before? I've read 1 Samuel many times, and I've studied it many times over my lifetime, but when I get up in the morning, it's my encounter with God, and it's a whole new way. I'm an older Christian now, I have other things that I see and I understand. And there's always new nuggets of things that God gives me in the morning. And I need to do it in the morning to prepare myself for the day. Because God speaks. And if you don't have that time with him, well then that's when the devil comes into your questions. And those questions can lead to doubt, which can lead you away from God. I don't know about you, but I, I feel like Asaph. God, I struggle with certain things, but I'm sticking close to you. You stick close to him and he will bless you greatly. Let's pray. God, thank you. Just for the fact of a, of a man like an Asaph, who's not afraid as a man to share his innermost thoughts and feelings uh, that are kind of shocking, especially in light of who he was in the temple. But uh, we can identify in many ways with him and his journey. Thank you that he was uh, brave enough to share it and also gave us much needed insight into how we are supposed to stick close to you all the way into glory knowing you're going to be with us all the way. And maybe you won't give us all the answers that we need to the questions that we face, but you will give wisdom and insight as you did to old Moses, that he wasn't out there on that limb all by himself. And you had great things to do in and through him as he was just faithful to you. Might we remain faithful in our relationship to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day with your families.